Uh, am I recording? I see the, is it, oh yeah, I am. What is the Trinity? Uh, okay, so welcome. Uh, tonight we're going to be covering, uh, you know, what is the Trinity? We'll cover it a little bit more broadly than that. This is really intended to be very high level, but if uh, you're joining us, welcome. Um, we are, uh, you've missed all the prayer and praise reports and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I was telling somebody yesterday that, that, you know, if you watch the recordings, you don't see the whole fellowship. This is not just streaming a teaching. Um, we, we do church together online. And so there's a lot more to this. There's actually quite a bit more to this. Um, so if you are isolated, especially right now, um, the whole coronavirus thing is going on right now and a lot of people are homebound. Um, if that's you and uh, you want to join us, you know, go, go to Christian Virtual Fellowship on Facebook. Um, we have a page there. You can find the, uh, the codes to, to join us, the times and codes there to join us. Or you can uh, go to allegiance to the king.org and contact us through that, uh, through that website, and uh, we'll, uh, I'll be happy to get you connected in. All right, so tonight, uh, this is, um, I believe, our second installment on our series on Christology. Who is Jesus? Who is God? All those kinds of questions. And, um, and so what we want to do tonight is we kind of want to do an overview of what is this thing that has been the predominant view of who God is and who Jesus is for the last um, couple of thousand years, or I guess 1600-ish years. And, um, and so we're going to kind of do a real high-level overview. I'm not going to go into detail. I've got a resources slide at the end that has just a smattering of some resources. This is a big subject. Um, we could spend um, at least one, if not multiple, sessions on uh, the, uh, the whole subject. Um, and, uh, and it's um, a, you know, not something that we can, you know, cover fully in a single session. So I'm really just trying to give uh, some, some basic overview kinds of stuff and, um, and not try and go too deep into this. But I do also, uh, when, you know, we'll, as we get towards the end of uh, the, the teaching, the presentation tonight, I want to kind of cover some, a few practical things about interacting uh, on this subject, and and so we'll get we'll do some of that as well. So, first thing is okay. So Christology and what you believe about who God is and and uh, uh, who Jesus is. There's a few kind of major views, and obviously the first one is you know Trinitarianism, and that the Trinitarians very essentially believe that there's one God who exists in three persons. And I won't go into detail right now. I've got uh, several slides where we're going to go into um, quite a bit of detail about what the Trinity is and, and uh, what is you know, believed. And we're going to use Trinitarian, I'm not going to use my definition of that. We're going to use their definition of that. Modalism which is one God that operates in three modes, where it's just one God and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are just manifestations of that God. They're just modes of that God. And there's several different ways that that works out, but and we're not going to cover that tonight. Then there's Arianism. This is, there's one true God. The Father is the one true God, uh, but uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are kind of lesser gods. That God uh, created um, the Holy Spirit got created Jesus, um, typically kind of at the beginning of time. Um, and, uh, you know, they're made, made of the same substance of, as God and those kinds of things. But the one true God is the father, uh, but God, Jesus, um, is a kind of, uh, of God and preexisted his birth. That's typical Arianism. There's some flavors of that in which it's a little bit different, but, we're not going to go into that tonight either. And then finally, Unitarianism, what we believe here at Legions to the King and Christian Virtual Fellowship. Uh, Unitarianism, uh, there is one true God, the Father. Jesus is the Messiah, who is a man, a very special man. 
And the Holy Spirit is either just a reference to God or to God's power. And typically Unitarians do not believe that uh, uh, Jesus preexisted his birth, but um, that that's Unitarianism. So, so what is, what is the Trinity? So the first thing I want to do is I want to get a, a brief history, a very brief history of the Trinity. Um, I'm definitely not going to do justice to this tonight, uh, but there are some good resources that I'll, I'll talk about at the end that, that give a, you know, better, do better justice to the history of the Trinity and how it developed is primarily what I'm interested in. How does this thing, you know, the history of its development kind of thing. So I'm gonna give you a very, very quick basic overview. I don't wanna spend much time on this. Um, so I apologize <laughs> that this is probably, um, I, I feel almost embarrassed that this is so shallow, but we'll just do a, a quick overview. All right, so by the late first century, we find in the first two epistles of John, we find the idea that some people are beginning to teach that Jesus is something other than a man, that he's something, you know, other than a human being. And, um, and John is writing against that. Uh, he calls that an antichrist teaching. And he has some very strong language uh, in Second John. He actually talks about not even allowing these people who are teaching and propounding this stuff in, into, their, into their churches. And so e even as early as the late first century, we start to see this shift away from the biblical Jesus, um, the, 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 the human Jesus to something different. Then by the time you get to the second and third century, you start to see a lot more of this coming into the church mindset. You see a big shift into Greek philosophical thinking. And the uh, leaders within the Christian church begin propounding things like Gnosticism and Logos theories and other, other kinds of things, making Jesus into something other than the human Jesus of the Bible. And um, at this point, the church still sees the Father as the one true God, generally. That's, you know, if you go through and you start reading their, their writings, you, you see there, they still think of the, the Father as one true God, but more and more and more, they're seeing Jesus as somehow a, a, a lesser God, a a, man, a manifestation that, uh, or, or something that God has, has brought uh, into being at the beginning of time, you know, those kinds of things. And, and so you start to see, this is really, you know, really, I, you know, when I, I read them, I think uh, a, a lot the, uh, of them would actually fit into the Aryan camp. Uh, but this is, this is the idea that this, this shift is continuing to take place where the more we're moving further and further and further away in the church as a whole, especially in the Roman world, um, uh, predominantly the Greco-Roman, the Roman Empire, more and more moving away from Jesus being a human being into something different, uh, a part of God, a, a kind of God. And by the time you get to the fourth century, um, the the fight over this within the church becomes political because you have Constantine who makes um, the uh, Christianity um, uh, legal and uh, the, you know, the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire kinds of things happening in that century. And, but the reality is even, you know, early in the century at the Council of Nicaea um, in the 320s, you get it's not that there's a fight between that Jesus is a human being, a man uh, born, uh, um, a, a, a human being did not preexist his birth or his, his conception, and, um, and the Trinity or Jesus is God or anything like that. It's not a fight between those two things. It's really a fight between Arianism and something else that's going to develop 
by the late uh, fourth century into Trinitarianism. And so that's really the fight. So then in, by the time you get to 381, you have the fully developed theory of the Trinity for the most part anyway. And uh, cer certainly that's rarely where you, you, you get the Trinity. Um, there really isn't a, um, a, uh, a, the Trinity idea, which we'll go to at length here in a second, um, uh, using one of the creeds, the, until the late uh, fourth century. So in 381, uh, there's a council and they put forth this idea uh, that we're gonna dig into here in a second. And basically the Roman, the Roman emperor decides, all right, that's the one and everybody has to believe that or else, right? And so people get killed over it, people uh, get exiled and they basically get forced into believing this thing. So certainly not the way Christians should decide what is true from the Bible. That should never take place at the end of a weapon and or by government fiat. And so that's a you know, brief history of how the doctrine came to be. Now for Protestants, this is an interesting question, is okay, if the Trinity was not a thing, it was a developed thing over several centuries, that grew into until the late fourth century. That's the first time you actually have what today we would call Trinitarians and their and the doctrine of the Trinity. If that doesn't occur till the fourth century for Protestants, that's a you know they should ask themselves: Do they really want to believe something that was a developed doctrine that nobody believed before the end of the fourth century? I don't think so. I I think Protestants should, by default, based upon what Protestants believe in, that the Bible has all of the doctrine in it, right? Um, and that the teachings of the apostles are what we have for faith and, and practice. And so for doctrine, right? All right, so let's, let's dig in. We're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the Athanasius Creed and the Athanasius Creed is pretty good uh, for this. It's uh, a little kind of over the top in some of its language, um, especially where salvation is concerned, but it's a pretty good um, detailed synopsis of what the Trinity doctrine is. Now I'm giving the Athanasius Creed that's um, the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't accept this creed, uh, but largely because of one little piece of it uh, which we don't need to worry about in this overview. Uh, but for the most part, this encapsulate, encapsulates the view of Trinitarianism. And, um, and so it's, a, it's, it's pretty good to, uh, to go through. All right. First thing it says, uh, and I'm going to do this pretty quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to kind of um, go through and see um, you know, what, what is this thing? And, and if you're watching the video and you're a Trinitarian, I would challenge you as we go through this to, to read these things and ask yourself the question, is that what you really believe? And is that what the Bible really says? Right? All right. So whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. So the first thing is, is that the, what we're about to see, the Trinity, is, um, is a, an essential doctrine for salvation, uh, uh, according to traditional Trinitarianism. Now, not all the Trinitarians believe that, uh, but in terms of typical official doctrine, in, in a lot of denominations anyway, that is the case. Now, this is the Catholic faith, that we should worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person, the person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. What quality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. The Father is uncreated. 
The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable. The Son is immeasurable. The Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet, there are not three eternal beings. There is but one eternal being. So, two, there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings. There is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. You know, it, you, when you read through this, you should be thinking, okay, wait a minute. It's really kind of self-contradictory. Similarly, the Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. The Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet, there are not three almighty beings. There is but one almighty being. Thus, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Yet, there are not three gods. There is but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet there are not three Lords, there is but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or Lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created, he was begotten from the Father alone. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And there's your little piece of um, problem between Eastern and Western um, uh, or Orthodox and Catholic churches. And, and just to, and again, if you're watching this, you're Trinitarian, I want you to think about this for a minute, that uh, Jesus is not made or created. He's begotten what the heck does begotten mean, right? What did it mean in the Bible, right? And asking yourself that question and going and seeing what does the word in the Greek language in the Bible mean to be begotten, right? Because it, they're agreeing. He's begotten of the Father, right? Okay. Um, now they're going to say from the Father alone, but begotten, all right? What does that mean? Accordingly, there is one father, not three fathers. There is one son, not three sons. There is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Nothing in this Trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller. In their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. And, okay, now we just said that the father was neither made nor created nor begotten, but the son was begotten and from the father and that the Holy Spirit um, uh, proceeded from the father and the son. Okay, I'm not sure what that means, proceeded, but here it's gonna say neither before or after, All right? Well, what does begotten mean then if not, you know, something coming after something else, you know, so, what does that mean, proceeding from something else? Um, so in everything, as was said earlier, we must worship their trinity in their unity and their unity in their trinity. Anyone then who desires to be saved should think thus about the trinity. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. We're going to get into the incarnation tonight, uh, but last section here. Now, this is the true faith. It's the last section of the creed. That we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. Not sure how that works, but that's what it says. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time, and he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time. Completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity turn, being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself. He is one certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of his person, for just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. And I, I, 
before I get to that last little piece, just kind of reminding about that brief history about the slow shift over several centuries from the human Messiah of the Jews and the Bible to something else. And it's kind of hard, you know, you can under, you can, you can understand the words being used here and you can repeat these words and you can say the words and you can say you believe those words, but getting at these concepts is something totally different. And we're gonna get into that here in a second. But, but what you can see is no matter how many times you use the word human here, we're not really talking about a human. You can't be God and human and be a human that doesn't make any sense because that's not what a human is. A human is not God. So how do you, how do you get that? Right. All right. Uh, he suffered for our salvation. He descended to hell. He arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the father's right hand from there. He will come to judge the living and the dead at his coming. All people will rise bodily and give an accounting of their own deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life and those who have done evil will enter into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. Side note, uh, this is called the Athanasius Creed. For, for a long time in the church, it was called that because it was attributed to Athanasius, but um, it, uh, he, he didn't write this. This came later. So this is a pretty good... Um, I think the Athanasius Creed is pretty good at saying what the Trinity is in terms of the language used and the, the parts of it. Um, you can quickly see also from this how, it, how easy it is to understand why it seems contradictory to so many people and why people have trouble with it. Even Trinitarians. I remember being in a a Trinitarian church at one time and uh, had a guy come up to me and, um, and uh, you know, he, he, he knew I knew a lot about the Bible and, and uh, um, was often answering questions and that kind of thing. And so he came up to me and he says, so how do you, how do you teach the Bible, uh, the Trinity? And I said, well, I don't because it doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, he goes, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me either. And uh, so, so, um, and you can see that in this as you, as you go through that. So that's pretty good, I think, um, you know, short way of, of, of saying what the Trinity is. It's hard to say what the Trinity is because as soon as you start to get into the details of, well, what does that mean exactly? People are short on answers. They don't really know. Um, so, so let's, you know, let's talk for a minute about that's the Trinity. And certainly people can espouse the Trinity and often do who are Trinitarians. They may not be able to recite the Athanasius Creed, but they can give a pretty quick synopsis of it. Usually God, you know, Jesus is God. God exists in three persons, co-eternal and co-equal. A lot of times they can get that much out, right? And, um, but here's the problem. The reality is for most Christians, most Trinitarian Christians, um, you know, that, that whole Athanasius Creed really isn't exactly what they believe. So here's some common examples of what they do believe. Um, a lot of them just think of Jesus just as God, right? Just, he just is God. There's one God and Jesus is that God, and that's it. And sure, uh, you know, if you start to, to ask about the differentiations, you might get some, and I'm not talking about modalism in this case. Um, you know, they just think of Jesus as God. That, you know, when they think of their God, they think of Jesus. And um, they don't really think in terms of the Trinity. They just think in terms of Jesus as their God. The second is that the Father is God, and Jesus is somehow also God, but is subordinate to the Father and has no idea what the Holy Spirit is. This, this is a common thing. You know, when I've asked people, you know, well, what, what exactly do you believe? And they'll say, well, I, you know, I believe, I just, just 
a few weeks ago, I was talking with a, a Trinitarian friend and asking him, you know, explain to me exactly what you believe. And I would ask questions as he would say things. And, and this is, this is a, with the exception of the Holy Spirit, um, this is what he described. It, you know, he believed God is, the Father is God, and Jesus is also God, but subordinate to the Father. He's like separate from the Father and, and subordinate to him. Well, that's Arianism, right? That's, that's what they were wrestling with in the second and third centuries, right? And then finally had this big political fight in the fourth century. That's Arianism. That's not Trinitarianism. The third, Jesus is the human son of God. This guy is uh, actually a Unitarian and doesn't know it. Um, and I'm sure probably uh, many of you who are biblical Unitarians, um, uh, you've probably encountered these kind of people where yeah, they're a Trinitarian in name only. They, if you ask them what they believe, they don't believe in the Trinity. They believe that, that Jesus is the human Messiah, son of God. And, and they've never thought uh, in terms of the Trinity. And in their view, they're actually a Unitarian. And finally, is the Trinitarian who's had enough education in the Trinity that they can actually espouse it. They can say God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-eternal and co-equal. And they know how to say the right words, but when you press them, they can't actually explain the ideas behind them. And this, this isn't just average Joe Trinitarian, right? The average Joe Trinitarian frequently doesn't actually believe in the Trinity and they don't realize it. Um, this includes pastors. If you start to ask a pastor to define these things, typically they are going, they can't do it at all. And they'll start to give weird analogies and stuff like that. And you're like, no, no, no. What, what does it mean that Jesus is both human and God? And pretty quickly they'll throw up their hands. I have no idea. It's a mystery. And so they can't really explain the ideas behind them. And so that's also you know, very, very common. So here's the thing. Don't argue with Joe, right? I think this is the best approach. Don't argue with Joe. Joe Trinitarian that believes in the, in the Trinity in some form or fashion. Um, you know, the reality is truth has a way of just making sense. And when something doesn't make sense and you start to poke at it a little bit, it, it, it does the job for you of demonstrating that it doesn't make sense, right? You don't really have to argue with Trinitarians. Instead, well, first of all, so let me give you a few points before I get to the instead. First of all, it's difficult to get anywhere until you know what a person actually believes, right? So we've already seen, and I'm sure many of you already know that what I, or I was showing in the last slide is very true that, um, you know, they, that just because somebody calls themselves a Trinitarian doesn't mean that you know what they believe. You have to ask them. So my friend that I was talking about earlier, um, you know, I knew he was a Trinitarian, right? Because he said he was a Trinitarian. And, but when I actually asked him, he wasn't a Trinitarian, he's an Arian, he just doesn't know it, right? So you can't really know until you ask him anyway, so why argue with them? You gotta, you gotta find out what they believe, right? Um, and uh, if you ask Joe to define what he means by the Trinity, uh, and you know, what he means is Jesus is God, and you start to try and drill down into that, okay, it's, it's going to be difficult for him to explain it. So don't let Joe just say the correct words, right? I remember uh, a, a friend in a, in a Trinitarian church asking me one time, well, you know, don't you believe Jesus is God? And it was such a difficult I mean, it's such a difficult question, right? I can say, no, I don't. But the problem is there's so much going on in his head that's not going on in my head. At the same time, I, I can't really, I can't just say yes or no to that question 
without a whole lot of explanation. Well, the same thing is going on if they're just using the correct words, right? If they're just saying, well, I believe Jesus is God. I believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all God, and there's just one God, but there's three persons, right? Well, you know what? That's not good enough. Just saying the words. If we're going to say that this thing is necessary to, believing this thing is necessary to salvation, well, you better dang well be able to explain what this thing is, not just use the correct words, right? So here's the thing. Don't argue with Joe. Ask him what he believes. And I, I've got a few questions uh, that I want to suggest. And, and I believe that there's a very good chance that Joe really hasn't thought very deeply about these questions. And that um, if you start to ask these questions, pretty quickly, Joe's going to become uncomfortable. So be nice to Joe, right? We're not trying to make Joe mad. We're trying to clarify what does Joe actually mean by the words that he's using, right? So here's some questions to ask Joe about. Who does Joe believe Jesus is, right? Remember what I said at the beginning that, that a lot of times you don't know what they believe and they might actually be a Unitarian and they just don't know it, right? Or they might believe that Jesus just is God, right? You, you don't know until you start asking what they actually believe and who, who is God, right? And as you start to ask those questions, they, they'll start to clarify for you, right? And that's the beginning of the process, right? And then you can say, when does Joe, uh, when does Joe believe that Jesus began to exist? This is a great question, right? Because this ferrets out the Arians from the Trinitarians, right? Because if they believe Jesus is God, they probably don't believe that he began to exist at his conception or birth, right? But when do they believe that he began to exist, right? Now, the Trinitarian um, lingo answer is he didn't begin to exist. He was begotten, right? Well, then you can go into, well, what does begotten mean, right? What does that mean? Doesn't begotten mean like conceived? Isn't that the same thing as conceived? And if we use begotten in every other single context, we always mean that that thing began to exist. So why doesn't it mean that in when you use the word here? Why are you using that word? And um, so when did he begin? Great question. Then what does Joe mean by person? And this is my favorite one, right? What, does he, what, what do you mean by person? What does that mean, right? Doesn't, doesn't person normally mean an individual like you and me? Isn't that what a person means? And what does he mean by being or God or essence? Because, you know, there's different ways Trinitarians will, will describe the Trinity. They may say one being in three persons. They may say one God in three persons. They may say one essence in three persons. Uh, they may say one divine being in three, three persons. There's different ways to, to, that the, the right words can be used. Uh, but what does self, what does it mean to be a person? Why is it, um, what, what is that? And, and there's, there's several different ways of defining this. Um, Dale Tuggy does a great job with this. The first one is, 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 God, is God the self or each of the person's self? So this is the self question. We think, you know, we think of ourselves as a self, right? I'm a person, but the, the idea is, okay, uh, throw away the word person because they're going to use that anyway. Let's talk about a self, right? I'm a self, you're a self. So the question is, is God the self or is the being the self or the divine being the self or the divine essence the self? Is that the self or are the three persons each a self? And if the answer is that the, the self um, is God, well, then what are the persons? Because if there's only one self, what do you mean by persons then? Because you can't mean a self. So are they modes? Are they personas? What are, what do you mean by person? Because normally when we use the word person, we mean a self. But if God is not the self, if the persons are selves, 
Well, how's that not three gods? Because again, a self is an individual. It's, it's what we mean by something individual. So if the person is a self, then you have three individuals and really you have three gods, right? So what do you mean exactly? Next one, what does Joe mean by co-equal? This is an interesting question. This I find to be the easiest of the three, of, of any question, I'm sorry, not the three, any of the questions that you can ask that a Trinitarian will pretty rapidly agree, yeah, I guess they're not co-equal, right? Because you see, what do you mean by co-equal when Jesus says that the Father is greater than him and Paul says that God is the head of Christ just as Christ is the head of a man. So what do you mean? Co-equal. How can they be co-equal when the Father is greater than Jesus? That doesn't sound like co-equal to me. And um, so what do you mean by that, right? And typically, they don't know what they mean by that. They know the words. They know that it's the right thing to say that they are co-equal. But probably they've never thought deeply about, well, what does that actually mean? And why is it that Jesus says the Father is greater? And so how can they be co-equal? That doesn't that doesn't make any sense. I know it's in the Athanasian's Creed, they try and make co-equal something. They're co-equal in this thing. Oh, okay. So they're only co-equal in one aspect. They're not co-equal in all ways. So there is a difference between them. Okay. Um, uh, and then finally, this is a good question. Who died on the cross? Did God die on the cross? Who died? Did anybody die on the cross? And again, a lot of Trinitarians have never thought deeply about that question, who died on the cross? And uh, um, that's a rather disturbing question, I think, for Trinitarians. Um, because if they say, well, uh, God died, but I guess God can't really die. And so maybe nobody died. Okay, well, that's a problem. Uh, that kind of undermines the whole Christian religion, right? If Jesus died, but God didn't die, well, then how is, doesn't that mean Jesus isn't God? <laughs> you know, aren't, isn't that what you're saying right now? And so you get into all kinds of two nature theories. There was a whole other fight in the fifth century about, really about this question, you know, what, what in the world is Jesus in this whole idea of human and, and God, uh, which we're not going to get into tonight. Okay. So those are some questions. I, I find that this is a really good approach to um, just, you know, don't have an agenda. Don't try and beat them up. Don't try and say, you're wrong. Just ask them questions. Make them clarify their own beliefs. What do you actually believe? What is, okay, you use certain words. What do you actually mean by those words? How, how is it that those things aren't self-contradictory? Help me understand what you actually mean. And I believe that in most cases, um, they're not going to have answers. Now, not in every door is that going to open up a, a conversation on what you believe and how that might make more sense. But on some it is, some people are going to go, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And why do I believe that? What do you believe? Right? You know, so it's a good approach. Finally, um, I want to uh, give you some resources. And again, this is a paltry list. Um, but, you know, these are some things that I really like. And uh, so I thought I'd share these and you guys can, um, uh, you know, most of you guys that are on with me tonight probably are familiar with most of these. Um, uh, but if you're watching, these are good resources. Uh, first of all, podcasts. Um, a couple of great podcasts, the Biblical Unitarian podcast that uh, Dustin Smith uh, does. It's a, a great podcast that focuses strictly on the subject of, of uh, Christology and uh, who God is, who Jesus is, uh, what biblical Unitarianism is, all that, all those questions. Uh, and uh, most of the, most of the podcasts are, are fairly short. And, um, and so it's a, a great podcast to subscribe to. And then the, the other is the Trinity's podcast. This is Dale Tuggy's podcast. 
um, a, a little bit longer format uh, in each episode, and he does a lot of interviews. Um, and, um, and so it's another great, great podcast. And then YouTube, uh, besides our own channel here on uh, our two channels, Allegiance to the King and Christian Virtual Fellowship, which if you're watching this, hopefully you're already subscribed. And um, uh, 21st One God, uh, which is uh, Dan and Sharon Gill's uh, YouTube channel um, and uh, uh, a lot of great uh, videos there. Uh, 20, uh, that's their YouTube channel. It's associated with their ministry, which is 21st uh, 21st Century Reformation, is that, did I get that right? Yeah, um, they have a website that goes with that. Um, uh, and then also, uh, and some of you may have never seen this before, uh, this is one of, uh, uh, that Lisa, uh, my wife likes a lot, is the Trinity Delusion. And I know, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time on that one, but I know a lot of people that really like the Trinity Delusion. Uh, a lot of great content there. Uh, and then some books. Uh, first of all, just strictly on the Trinity, what is the Trinity? Dale Tuggy has a, a great book, What is the Trinity? If you're not familiar with Dale Tuggy, he is a, a philosopher of religion and an expert on Trinity theories. And he's got a great little book on what is the Trinity. Uh, Keegan Chandler has a great book, The God of Jesus, uh, that covers a lot of the history of the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. It's a great book on that. Uh, Richard Rubenstein also has a great book on some of the history of the fight of the fourth century over the doctrine uh, of, you know, who Jesus is and who God is, and uh, that's uh, when Jesus became God. Uh, the Son of God, Three Views on the Identity of Jesus. Uh, uh, this is Dustin Smith and a couple of other authors. It's one of these, you know, multiple view books. So Dustin gives the biblical Unitarian view. And um, uh, it's a, a great book to com, uh, compare the views with. And then this is a book I read a long time ago that I really liked. Uh, uh, Brian Holt is a Jehovah's Witness and certainly some things that I would disagree with him about, but I really like the format of his book, Jesus God or the Son of God. He basically goes through the first part of the book is him addressing uh, a bunch of the most common verses used by Trinitarians in support of the Trinity. Um, and that's okay. There's a number of books that do that. Um, you know, One God, One Lord from Spirit Truth uh, International does that. And, uh, you know, other books do that. Um, uh, you're going to see that kind of stuff addressed uh, from uh, Anthony Buzzard and, and other folks. But I really like the next section of Brian Holt's book where he goes into 200 verses that show that Jesus is a man and not God. And uh, and it's really good. It's, it's really, really good. Um, as, so it's, uh, it's almost a great reference for that. So I really like that one as well. Uh, so those are just some resources. Again, um, this is a, a very short list. There's a, a lot more. I didn't even put web pages on here because I couldn't, I didn't quite fit it in, but there's uh, you know, great web pages out there as well. And uh, certainly, you know, our, I, I encourage you to visit our site, uh, uh, allegiance to the king.org. Uh, there's also a new site, uh, Unitarian Christian Alliance. I don't remember if it's .com or .org off the top of my head, um, uh, but I think it's .org. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty new site that is focused on um, uh, biblical Unitarianism and, uh, uni well, Unitarianism in general. Actually, I think they're, they're a little broader than that. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of great resources these days, much more than there used to be. And uh, so, you know, if you're interested in more, uh, definitely, um, you know, get in contact with us. Um, there's a, a, a lot more resources than this, but this is a great start. And finally, let's open it up for some questions. Let me stop sharing. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got John. Can I just make a quick caveat? Yeah. Um, it, it's very likely that people who don't believe what we believe are going to be watching this video, which means they're going to be watching the question and answer. So I would encourage all of us to uh, temper our speech with some grace. Um, you're not going to win people over by telling them how stupid their view is. Um, <laughs> a lot of that has been taking place in the chat but I don't think that's really helpful for this conversation. You might feel that way, but 
that doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't benefit or edify any of us right now. Um, and that's not going to help win anyone over. So I would, yeah, that's I would a, recommend people not make those comments. That's really a good point uh, you know, it, you know, uh, you know, and, and not just, I don't know if any Trinitarians will watch this video um, or even make it this far <laughs> into this video. Uh, but the reality is, is that, you know, we want to be full of grace um, uh, towards people. And it, the vast majority of Trinitarians don't even have any idea what they actually believe. And that's why I think it's always best to just ask them questions, just get them to clarify what they believe. And a lot of times they'll just talk themselves out of it, um, you know, because they'll start realizing that what they're saying doesn't make any sense and they don't really understand and they don't really know and, and that sort of thing. So definitely we want to, we always want to be, uh, you know, gracious and remember that, you know, Jesus was very gracious towards each one of us. And um, I know I, I've believed wrong things and had to change my views a number of times. So I, I hope people will always have grace towards me. Okay, let's see, uh, Pat and Pam have their hand up. I'm gonna be gracious, I think. Um, <laughs> first of all, I, um, I was raised Catholic and it was very easy for me to believe that there was one God, mainly because I must've been on automatic pilot whenever I went to church. But um, what I have seen and with other people, I be totally believe they have, they don't teach from the Bible. They have another book that they use when you go in. As a matter of fact, when I was going to a Catholic church, there was no hymns being sung ever. It was all pious and holy, and there was Latin being spoken all through the sermon or whatever. Anyway, I don't even know that there was a sermon. I don't ever believe that. But they don't read the Bible, and so consequently, they don't teach from the Bible. So it's hard for these people to really um, grasp something else if they've spent their entire life believing what the priest has told them. It's the priests and the archbishops and all those people that have the Bible and use the Bible to um, teach their doctrine. Um, that's my statement. The other thing I wanted to make, I uh, wanted to ask you is, can you please define the difference between Unitarianism and monotheism? Or so, being monotheistic? Yeah. Yeah, monotheism is a is a uh, a more you know general term. Uh, it means the belief in one God as opposed to polytheism or pantheism. Um, polytheism being you know believing in multiple gods. Um, uh, pantheism believing that everything is God. Um, they uh, so monotheism is just strictly you know the view that there there's there's one God, right? <laughs> now, so, you know, um, Muslims, for instance, are monotheists. They believe in one God, right? Jews are monotheists. They believe in one God. And Christians, um, they're going to, you know, Christians believe in one God. Um, and Trinitarians, it's it's not really, I don't think it's a, a, a good line of, of argumentation to try to say, you know, to tell a Trinitarian, well, you're not a monotheist, you believe in multiple gods, um, because they're going to just flat out deny that. They're going to say, no, we are absolutely monotheists, we believe in one God. And it, it's much better, you know, if you're going to try to show them, mm, not really, uh, you, you, you can't convince them. They have to become convinced themselves that there is a problem in, in the, the view of the Trinity with that idea. But they have to come to that conclusion on their own. You're not, you're not going to make them do that. Um, so that's monotheism. So Unitarian, it, uh, specifically within the, the idea of, of Christianity, has to do with the belief that there is one true God, right? And you, um, there's um, a, a, you know, uh, different ways you can do that, right? I mean, some people like to say that Arians are Unitarians. 
I, I particularly don't, I don't think that's a, a good description. Um, I think it, it, you know, if you're going to be an Aryan, call yourself an Aryan. Um, uh, but um, so Unitarian generally means belief in the one true God. Now there's also Unitarian Universalists, which I think they should stop using that name um, because they mean something totally different by that. But oh well, what are you going to do? Uh, and then, you know, uh, the term Christian Unitarian or Biblical Unitarian has, you know, become more popular to differentiate uh, specifically Unitarians that believe Jesus is a human being that did not preexist his birth. Um, so th there's still sort of, there's kind of a philosophical fight over the use of that term. And, um, you know, this is my personal opinion. I think Unitarian should strictly mean belief that there is one true God, the Father, Yahweh, and, uh, and that's it. Um, that's what Unitarianism is. There are no other gods in that sense. And, um, and that Jesus is a human uh, who was born, um, you know, God, you know, created in time, space and time, uh, you know, at his conception, that kind of thing. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Okay, one quick last thing I want to say, and that is, um, since I've been in South Dakota, I ran into a pastor who said that he thought that the Unitarians were nutto, nut jobs, you know. And this was, he was telling me this in the hospital in front of everybody. Um, but anyway, and then um, one of my coworkers the other day said um, she that she was Catholic and that... Um, I was talking to her about the Bible, blah, blah. She said, the Bible, she said, uh, that's just written by man. That has nothing to do with God and Jesus. And then I started to say, well, how did you learn about Jesus if you didn't know if, you know, how would she have ever known about Jesus if she didn't believe anything in the Bible was written by men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So anyway, those are the kinds of, um, backlash i get sometimes <laughs> on that on that first one the, by that that pastor uh did he mean unitarian universalists or did he, he must mean... have because when you said that i thought maybe that might have been the term he used yeah, not... a... yeah you know i i think that you know you have to ask people you know you have to say to them what do you mean what 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 are you talking about right what do you mean by that um it because in the general um, Christian population, if they say Unitarian, they're not going to mean you or me, Pam. They're generally going to mean a Unitarian Universalist. And Unitarian Universalist, um, the Unitarian Universalist yeah. Church is, um, they, they basically do anything, right? So you decide, in the Unitarian Universalist Church, you decide what you're going to be, right? So for instance, I have some cousins that are Unitarian Universalists, and um, and, uh, my, my cousin's son, um, I remember at one point, uh, she was talking about, uh, he went through a process of deciding what he was going to be and he chose to be an atheist. Right. Huh. And, um, and so they, they kind of anything, you know, goes kind of, oh, okay. Lead to God well, it's, things. it's basically you just pick, um, you know, what you want to be kind of thing. And so it's very, very different. And, uh, and so, you know, you, if somebody says Unitarian, probably that's what they mean. You have to clarify. And they may be shocked and surprised to, to find that they're, no, traditional Unitarians are not like that. Um, and, um, and there are lots of Unitarians today that are Christian Unitarians or Biblical Unitarians. Uh, Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Dean's got his hand up. One major thing between God and his son is that God is eternal, having no beginning and no ending. Jesus Christ had a beginning, but no ending. So he has everlasting life. From God's point of view, maybe he could be eternal just from God's point of view, but not in reality, because Jesus Christ had a beginning. God alone is eternal. No one else is. That's why I like the question, you know, that you you ask the other person, you know, when when do you think Jesus began to exist, right? And probably 
they've never thought about that question before. And as they think through what their view actually is, they're probably going to give you an answer that is in one of two camps. It's either in the camp of they're saying the right words, right? They've been taught the Trinity doctrine enough to say the right words. They're going to say, well, Jesus didn't begin to exist. He's always existed, right? And then you can go down one path, which is the whole begotten thing. Well, why did it? Why does it say he was begotten then? Uh, um, that's one path. But they may tell you, they may answer the question from the standpoint of what they actually believe. Um, and so you may get, like I did with my friend, uh, you know, I don't know, a couple months ago or so, where, you know, I asked him that question. And he said, you know, that at the beginning of time, God created Jesus. And I said, oh, so he began to exist, um, you know, as like the first thing. Was that the first thing that God created? And he's like, yeah, yeah. That's what he actually believes, even though he doesn't realize that's not the Trinity, right? And so if you ask that question, I think that's a great question to ask people without telling them, you know, you know again, the problem is if, for people who are already Christians, if you come to them saying, your view is wrong, my view is right, you're probably gonna get a wall, right? They're probably not gonna to listen to you. But if you come to them and ask them to explain what they mean by this thing, right? What, well, you know, when, when did Jesus begin to exist? What, you know, what do you mean by person? All those kinds of things, get, put it back on them, make them explain stuff, right? I do the same thing with apologetics with um, agnostics and, and especially with atheists, I don't argue with atheists. I just make them explain what they actually think and believe uh, because the reality is most of them haven't really thought it through that much and it starts to become problematic as they start to try and define it, right? And same thing happens with the, the Trinity. You know, the problem is that, uh, what um, Pam mentioned is that, you know, like in, with the Catholic Church, they don't read the Bible for the most part. They go by their their uh, leaders, the priests and the cardinals and the bishops and so on, and the Pope, and they don't know. It's, you know, the same thing with when I was in the way international, a lot of, a lot of stuff that we found out later was not true, but I was taking the opinion of Dr. Weirwell and others. I think that. that's, yeah, I think that's true for, uh, you know, a lot of people and a lot of denominations and churches, people tend to kind of go with what they, they were follow the leader and yeah. if, without checking things out, which is bad. And they, they don't know many times how to check those things out. So that's why they have to follow the leader. Yeah. And all the more reason to have compassion on them because remembering based on what you just said, Dean, what does that make them? They're following the leader. They're a sheep, right? And what did Jesus do? He had compassion on the sheep, right? So, you know, we, that's you know, I have a question. big part of the reason why that's important. Yeah. That creed that you, that you uh, read is the one that, you know, pretty much all mainstream Christians are supposed to, or their leadership would say. No, I wouldn't put it that way. Their leadership would say, you know, this is, this is what, we ascribe to with regard to Christology? Um, I, I would say there's probably a lot of um, Protestant and Catholic Christians that are going to basically say yeah to the Athanasius Creed. Um, Orthodox, Greek, and Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians are going to have a problem with parts of that creed. I wasn't really even thinking about Orthodox. Um, I was but, just talking about mainline, you know, a, a Protestant yeah, I, I think they generally, Christians. it's not like they're going to have that creed necessarily as part of their official statement on their website or something like that. It's just that if you were to to ask, let's say, a, you know, a, a, a Protestant pastor, um, it, you know, is this what you believe? They're probably going to say yes, or at least close to Dustin's it. Time. Yeah, Dustin. You know, I, th I think you kind of put the nail on the head when you said that, um, Oftentimes there's this, I don't know what it is, but there's this desire to make the confession that 
quote, Jesus is God, end quote. Like for whatever reason, that is, for a lot of people, that is the litmus test of whether you're an authentic Christian or not. Despite the fact that nowhere in the Bible is anything close to that, we know those words aren't there, uh, or ever listed as any, as any sort of confession. What is interesting, though, is that we do have a litmus test for confession, and you brought this up, because in 1 John 4, 2, um, it actually says that everyone that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in flesh um, is from God. And notice that there's, it, the, for them, the litmus test is confessing the humanity of Jesus, Okay, I guess you're just confessing. And then in 2 John, it's those who acknowledge that Jesus has come in flesh. So there's a, a confession and an acknowledgement. So I, I, I just find it interesting that the biblical definitions of what you confess are so far from the popular definitions of what people should confess. And not only so far, they're really, they're polar opposites. And so I actually think I would encourage us to uh, stick if we're having conversations with people, let's stick with the biblical things that it's asking them to do. I'll ask him, do you think that Jesus is a human being? Because it's very clear when you read that Athanasian creed, that is not what it said. You know, it, it, it said that, um, that, 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 that God absorbed humanity, not even a human being, just God absorbed humanity. What, what, I mean, what does that mean? It's like Jesus is not even a real human being anymore. Um, you also don't see any references to like the son of David in any of those. And yet Jesus being the son of David is listed as qualifications in the saving gospel message in multiple times in the new Testament. So I, I, I really liked your, your series in the podcast, uh, that, that you've been doing uh, there. I don't know if you're done yet or not. I'm, I'm not quite, probably not. but, uh, on the son of man, but I really liked in the in the it was one of the first ones where you went through the Old Testament and every single place where it was using the Son of Man, and with the exception of the Book of Daniel, every single time it uses the Son of Man, it makes it clear that he's a, that 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 phrase means a human being. And uh, I, I mean, it was so abundantly clear by the time you got done reading all of them off, it was like, wow, that. There should be no argument about that ever again. Um, I've, I've, well, I was just going to say to what Dustin was saying that I've encountered some uh, Trinitarians who um, interpret in Romans where it talks about confessing Jesus as Lord as saying that he's God because they're viewing the Lord as the same as Lord in the Old Testament, meaning Yahweh. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've seen that before. Um, uh, again, you know, by the time you get in a conversation with someone to the extent that they're trying to argue with you about your position, you're on bad footing, right? Um, you know, there's a, a, you know, I've talked to you guys before about um, the book Tactics by Greg Kokel. And it very much applies, his tactics for apologetics very much apply in this case as well. That if you've gotten to that point where they're trying to prove to you that if you don't believe that Jesus is God, then you're not saved, you're, you're, you're losing the argument, right? This is why I say it's way better to make them define what they actually mean and believe, mm -hmm. right? Um, because they're going to have a very difficult time doing that. And they may want to try and, because this is typical in debate or argumentation, is they're, they're going to want to try and push, push it back on you, make you answer the question. Don't do that, right? Explore their view and their belief. Make them defend their view and their belief. Theirs is the major view, defend it, right? Mm -hmm. make, it, make it make sense. And you can't, so they're going to have trouble with that. Uh, I will say that the you know the times when I've I've encountered that a a thing that you can do to address that is show them where it says that there is one God the Father and one Lord Jesus and it creates a differentiation uh, between them. So uh, oh yeah, uh, I, I had the experience here. Yeah, Edgar. It's good. Yeah, we need we need to be gracious, really. 
because I had uh, an experience one time. I was uh, sharing the truth to a senior citizen and he has a stop on his hand. I was telling her, I was telling him that uh, his faith is uh, unbiblical. He got angry with me, so angry, and he is about to, to beat me with a stop. <laughs> I run away because I don't want to get hit, hit by the, by his stop. I found out that really you, you cannot you cannot use an approach that is direct confrontation. Uh, it's good that we learn how to ask questions and let them explain the kind of faith that they have. It's it's not easy to convince a Trinitarian to embrace Trinitarian faith. It's not easy. It's hard. But approaches is very important. We 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 must learn how to approach those kind of uh, faithful to to really accept us and uh, believe in the in in the truth that we are sharing. Uh, that experience of mine taught me a big lesson. From then on, I changed my approach. I now try my best to be gracious, just like Justina said a while back. We need to be gracious with those uh, people who are uh, Trinitarian, who are oneness, uh, those who do not believe that Jesus is human being. Well, I learned my lesson and I'm so thankful also for the question that uh, we have here that you have shared with us. I can use that question, uh, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, close out the recording. Um, if you're watching this video and you want to join us, uh, visit us on uh, Christian Virtual Fellowship on Facebook, and uh, you'll find the, the links there. And you know, uh, like the page, and uh, we also have Allegiance to the King uh, Facebook group as well. And you can request to join that group, and uh, we'll bring you into the uh, into the group. Um, uh, but it, you know, it's important to us to to always make sure that you know. If you're viewing this, that you understand that, you know, this is this is not like a, you know a, other ministries. Nothing wrong with them, but other ministries that are putting out content onto the um, onto the internet on YouTube or what whatnot. Again, nothing wrong with doing that, but what we're doing is 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 only very partially that. Um, you know, we're a church, and if you're a biblical Unitarian and you don't have a church home, um, come be a part of our church home and. Um, and be part of our family.